Welcome, everybody. All right, let's. Uh, I'm just going to get started with the introduction here and uh, and the kickoff, and then we'll and then we'll dive in, Matt. So, welcome everybody to uh, the the first episode of the Torch of Progress. This is the series, uh, uh, the interview series for our high school course uh, online summer program, Progress Studies for Young Scholars. Um, Progress Studies for Young Scholars is uh, an, an online program aimed at high school students and, and up um, in the history of technology that was just launched. Uh, literally the first class started on Monday um, and uh, is a joint effort of uh, myself, uh, Jason Crawford of the Roots of Progress and Higher Ground Education, uh, which is the largest operator of Montessori and Montessori inspired schools in the United States. Um, so this is our speaker series. Uh, we are gonna be doing uh, about a weekly event, uh, an interview with a number of different folks uh, relevant and related to progress studies. Uh, a lot of uh, professors and uh, teachers who have uh, written and taught about uh, economics, history, um, economic history and, and so forth. Also some folks who are more on the frontier of, of progress, making progress happen, technologists and entrepreneurs. Some upcoming events that we've got uh, next week, uh, we have Tyler Cowan, who was one of the, who was a, an economist at George Mason, who uh, along with Patrick Collison coined the term progress studies uh, in the Atlantic last summer. Uh, Tyler Cowan will be uh, speaking with us next week on Tuesday, June 9th at 12 noon Pacific time. The week after that, we will have Patrick Collison. Uh, Patrick is, the, again, the co-author of that Progress Studies article and the co-founder of a very successful uh, private technology company, uh, sort of late stage technology startup in Silicon Valley called Stripe. Patrick Collison will be with us on Wednesday, June 17th uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific. And the week after that, we will have Max Roser, who is uh, the founder of Our World in Data, a website uh, devoted to research and data to make progress against the world's uh, biggest problems. It's sort of a uh, data-driven global development uh, research site, ourworldindata.org. And Max Roser will be with us on Wednesday, June 24th at this time, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And all those things will be announced if you sign up for our mailing list at uh, on our website at progressstudies.school. If you uh, follow uh, me uh, on Twitter at Jason Crawford or the Progress Course Twitter account, um, uh, or like us on Facebook, with these are, we'll be announcing the uh, the times and giving the registration links in all those different ways. Okay, that said, let's dive into today's event. Uh, I am Jason Crawford. I write a website called The Roots of Progress, where I write about the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. And I'm your host. Uh, with me today is Matt Bateman. Matt is the VP of Pedagogy at Higher Ground Education. It says a lot about Higher Ground, I think, by the way, that they have a VP of Pedagogy. Um, they are a, a set of folks who are very deeply uh, philosophical about the way that they approach um, education. And Matt has a, a very interesting and varied background. He has a PhD in philosophy. Uh, he also did some work in cognitive neuroscience. And now he helps run a school and launch awesome things like the Progress Studies for Young Scholars. So. Uh, welcome, Matt. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. All right. So let's start off with Montessori. Um, Higher Ground is uh, 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 runs Montessori schools, including Guidepost Montessori, and then also has Montessori-inspired schools like your high school, the Academy of Thought and Industry. Um, uh, many, many people have heard about Montessori, but I think a lot of people don't know what it is. I went to a Montessori school uh, from kindergarten up through age nine or so. And I could only sort of tell you what it is. I don't think I've got a really crisp, um, you know, uh, ver you know I, I couldn't say very crisply kind of what is the philosophy and what is the method. So just let's just start with that. What is the essence of Montessori? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it, I mean, and there are a lot of misconceptions out there that I shared until I learned about Montessori, like really learned about Montessori in my 30s. Um, so um, um, the essence of the Montessori method is that it is education built on the idea of the child's independence. 
Um, and, a, and a lot goes into the idea of independence. You could look at it from a, a many different facets. Independence is not just, you can make your own choices, though it is that. It's not just that you can think for yourself, though it is that. It's not just that um, you can be economically independent someday, but though it is that. It's, it's that you are fundamentally capable and willing to live your own life. And her view is that um, children are on this path from a very young age, from birth essentially, and that whether we like it or not, children are the ones doing the work of kind of creating themselves and creating their lives. And our job as educators, as parents, as caretakers, is to really tap into that work and to understand how hard it is, how effortful it is, how much thought it takes, um, to not see ourselves as like, um, I'm the one who kind of give my, gives my child everything, but rather to see the child as, the child is working really hard to become an independent person, and how can I help with that process? This is really hard work. Um, and she came up with a totally different approach to education based on this view of children. I mean, there's, there are many more elements to it than this, but her idea is if you prepare the environment in a certain way and you set the child up for success in a certain way, you scaffold the child um, kind of such that they can do certain things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do and you empower them and you inspire them and you surround them with really, really valuable inputs. So you have a learning environment where everything that they choose to do is going to be developmentally valuable then the child can really seize the reins of their self-creation and experience it that way. And that in and of itself has a lot of positive effects. Um, I mean, most people probably know Montessori through, um, you know, there's learning materials and there are preschools where the children kind of get to make choices and, and kind of do what they want. Um, all of that has had elements of truth in it, but it, it's actually a very structured pedagogy based on the idea of See, unlocking a child's independence in a kind of specific sequence. You talked about um, giving the child scaffolding, uh, and that reminded me, I've heard this term in connection with Montessori, prepared environment. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give some examples of that what, what, or, or elaborate on what is that scaffolding or that environment? I mean, here, here's a, um, here, here are two examples. One is very simple. So um, scaffolding is kind of like, the, the metaphor is like a support structure for a building under construction. It's like, you couldn't just build a skyscraper just kind of like by stacking things on top of one another without some sort of structure on the outside that lets you do things before it's fully ready to be built. And so the idea with children is they can do a lot. Um, they can erect these structures of knowledge. They can build their character, but they need some sort of support structure around them while they're kind of not yet a fully formed person yet. Um, so here's a really simple example. Um, um, one, one that I think Maria Montessori has won the day on. You see this now in lots of non-Montessori schools. Everything in a, in a preschool, in a Montessori preschool is child-sized. Like the children can access, can open the cabinets themselves. They can get the glasses out themselves. The tables are at their size. Um, this was, I mean, when Maria Montessori invented this in the early 20th century, this was like, no, but there was no children's furniture. Like she had to go find special children's furniture manufacturers and make them. Um, here's a more complicated example. Um, children um, to understand the, the kind of key into math um, is um, the thing that links counting, which children kind of more or less learn how to do themselves, that a Montessori helps them do that, with higher order mathematical operations is the decimal system. It's understanding things like place value, understanding that like when you move a one from here to here, it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Now it means 10. And this is really, really abstract and very hard for children to understand. Well, you can scaffold that. You can make learning materials that really concretize this idea. Um, you can have um, a series of beads that um, when the beads are grouped together in numbers greater than nine form a line that indicates that something different is happening and that the beads now mean something different. Now it's not one bead, it's one line. So th there's a whole sequence of materials like this that concretize abstractions. Um, there's other ways too, but you're making something accessible to a child's mind, to a child's power, to a child's ability that isn't otherwise accessible, and you're thereby letting them understand something independently or letting them do something independently that if you just kind of set them loose in your apartment um, and we're like, figure it out or, you know, pour yourself a glass of water, like, they can't do that yet. They need scaffolding, right? That's, that's the idea. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, independence as a, as a really central principle. How would you distinguish then Montessori from, or what differentiates it from, I guess, so, so I live in Silicon Valley and yeah. have spent my career here and there's like a bunch of, you know, w Silicon Valley people sometimes try to go do education and they, um, 
you know, we're a, we're a culture where we really like independence, independent thinking, even contrarianism. And we would, uh, and we would love for our kids to go sort of pursue subjects very independently. But I think, you know, uh, maybe when Silicon Valley people do education, it often ends up being a lot, just like very child driven. Yeah. And I, my feeling is Montessori is very much not that way. So what's, so if it's about independence, like what's the difference? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Montessori, it's interesting. Montessori herself struggled and I think succeeded at, at articulating this issue during her lifetime. Um, so she gradually changed the way that she talked about independence and you can see this in different editions of her work. Hmm. Um, so zooming way out, I think that there are basically two dominant schools of pedagogy, especially over the last few hundred years, but really going back to um, the kind of dawn of formal education in Rome and even the dawn of educational ideas in Greece. Um, so one is you could call it the traditional view. Sometimes it's called the Prussian model or the classical view. Um, the idea is um, what the, like the, the child's job is to learn stuff and the adult's job is to teach them stuff. And there's stuff that's important for you to know. And, and it's true, actually, that there's stuff that's important for you to know. And it's true that adults can help children learn things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to figure out. Um, but from this, you get the kind of medieval grammar schools, you get traditional, what, what is 19th century public schools and what are now traditional US public schools. You get the kind of system of education that is you know, sometimes called teacher-centered or teacher-driven, um, where the student is like, you sit in the desk, the student's job is to learn, to kind of take exams. The student has typically taken a more passive role. The student's motivation is often not so strongly considered. Um, but the student does, I mean, in a, in a good case, the idea is the student is learning things that they need to know. So that's one school, traditional. The other school is a kind of reaction against this progressive education. It's like, how much does it really matter exactly what the student knows? Um, isn't it more about curiosity and learning to learn? And if you look at people, the best people, aren't they kind of autodidacts? Or don't they kind of teach themselves? And isn't there a way to spark that and, and create that spirit of independence? So let's, let's kind of forget about having them sit in desks all day and having them memorize things and having the teacher run things. Let's, let's have the students at the center of the learning focus more on their motivation and, and kind of empowering them to learn and making sure that their curiosity stays alive. Um, Montessori does not fit very well into either of these camps. Um, she definitely is not a traditional educator. She was one of the first historically, I mean, kind of, she was ra railing against traditional education at the, at the same time as Dewey and the other progressives were. Um, but progressive educators rejected her. Like, I mean, it's particularly in the US, but more generally, they, were, they did not think that Montessori was progressive enough. They thought that it was too structured. Um, they thought that she was too prescriptive with the learning materials. She, she, she finds this third way, this third path where, um, yes, it's child-centered, but there's something to center the child. And it's important that adults think about how to provide that. This is not just the child making choices and the child kind of following their interests. There's guidance that adults have to give, and it has to be given thoughtfully in a way that deeply recognizes that like there is no learning that's not autodidactic at some level, like all learning is self-learning. Um, but like there is a role for teachers, there's a role for coaches, there's a role for learning materials, there is a science of pedagogy. Um, and this is really important. Just, to, just one other analogy on this point. Um, in, in parenting literature, I think people understand this issue better. There's like permissive parenting where you're like, I don't want to say no to my precious child, like they can do whatever they want. And then there's like authoritarian parenting where it's like, I mean, you know, child talk, child, children are to be seen and not heard. Or the child talks back and they get the belt. That's the old fashioned version. And then, but th those are both widely recognized as wrong. Like if you look at any kind of parenting literature expert, it's like, you want to be an authoritative parent. You want to be firm and loving. And, and this is the idea in Montessori. You want to be, you want to offer scaffolding, structure, knowledge, and autonomy, agency, choice. And that this not a, there's this oscillation between these two things that I think you see in education that Montessori just completely transcends. Um, that's a high level answer, but that's, that's the answer, I think, the most fundamental answer. Yeah. So the Montessori method was developed originally, as I understand it, for younger children, and yeah. uh, most Montessori schools are for younger children. How do you extend these ideas up to the high school level? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really based on um, what I just said. So the, the idea is the, the two schools of education that I just talked about, traditional versus progressive, that distinction transcends ages. You can have a traditional or progressive elementary school, a traditional or pro progressive preschool even, um, where you're like drilling the alphabet, like these things exist. Um, 
believe it or not. You see it in, um, in certain kind of high academic environments or um, immersion schools where it's like really drill and kill. Um, and th the same thing is true in adolescence. We, what we want is a high structure, high autonomy adolescent environment. The question is, what does that look like? Um, Montessori, when she wrote about adolescence, um, she, ha she had a pretty developed view of, um, of, a, of a middle school model in particular. She said less about high school. And her view was, you should go and live on a kind of farm boarding school situation where you're um, away from your family, where you are um, working the land, um, where you're actually kind of engaging in productive activity, where you're selling what you, what you grow, where you're participating in economic activity, and then lecturers and expert, um, expert teachers come in and integrate things like, um, you know, she thought that there should be a mu museum of machines where like you learn about the history of industry on the farm and chemistry lessons get integrated and there's history lectures. And so school gets integrated into the life of, um, of the middle schooler living on the farm. Um, but it is, it is, it is kind of part of this practical life experience where they're getting this broader independence and they're, they're thinking about, um, okay, like I'm away from my family now. Like, what is it to live? What is it to earn money? Um, why do I even need to learn these things that I'm studying? Now that's become part of the explicit part of the conversation. Um, th I mean, this is not how we run our schools for a number of reasons. Um, one is, um, you know, most of our schools are urban. It's not that easy to kind of create farming boarding schools. Um, another is that, um, I think that the principles underlying that model are, they can be applied to different contexts. You can have students working and running businesses and being entrepreneurial, especially today. I mean, today there's, been, there's no better time for somebody with very little to get very connected and to try to figure out how to market something or um, how to make something or how to sell something. Um, so um, the kind of way that you participate in economic activity is more accessible. Montessori thought that it was like very implausible that, um, that like middle school students would be able to participate in economic life without us setting up a business for them. Um, um, but part of the reason is I, I just think high structure, high autonomy, like that's the principle. Um, and you can have that in a number of different ways. Like our schools are, um, you can kind of think of them as like, like a great liberal arts college or a great books program, um, like combined with like an entrepreneurship um, camp or, or, or a startup or something like the students are, have tons of projects, they're like out there doing stuff, um, but they're also getting like a classical education um, and, and these things kind of come together and are integrated. It's high structure, high autonomy, that's the idea. Yeah, great books program plus an entrepreneurship program <laughs> sounds like an awesome high school to me. Uh, let's talk about Maria Montessori, the person. Um, sure. So yeah. just tell, tell me a little bit about her life and career and maybe how that led to all of this. Yeah, she has a really fascinating um, and underappreciated life story. She's one of these people where I feel like somebody's going to make a movie out of her um, one day and it's going to win a lot of awards. Um, so she lived um, from the 1870s to the 1950s. So she, she kind of spanned the like Victorian era slash two world wars slash Great Depression, this, this chunk of the early 20th century that saw all of this um, cultural flowering and, and innovation. Um, kind of sour and turn into world wars and a depression and, um, and other horrible things. Um, she got her, she was the first, um, she, 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 she's an Italian. She was the first medical doctor or among the first medical, medical doctors who was a woman who was in Italy. Um, and she kind of had to fight um, to, to do that. Um, and her first position was at this orthophrenic um, school, which is like a child care center attached to an insane asylum. That, that's how it was in Rome. And um, in working, I mean, she did a bunch of other things medically too. She was kind of gaining a reputation for herself, but she started to notice that um, what many people were interpreting as children being crazy and unmanageable and animals was actually children being understimulated. So like people would like throw breadcrumbs on the floor and watch the children scramble for them because they're so hungry and they're starving animals. And then she noticed the children aren't even eating them. Like they're like playing with them and lining them up and building things out of them. And, and she started to really um, try to develop a program for these students and study them. And she became a kind of advocate for them. It's like, what is going on here? Like, how are we thinking about underprivileged children? Um, that led to an opportunity where she was running a school for um, slum children. She, she kind of got a reputation doing that. And then this um, charitable, like a housing project essentially was like, hey, 
we have this housing project, we're providing cheap housing for families, but then they go to work and the children just destroy the place. Can you run a school? So she went and created a school for them, working with a couple of teachers. And there she really developed her ideas. Um, she, um, she started to make children's furniture. She started to experiment. She started to bring in psychological experimental apparatuses that were used elsewhere and for teaching math and seeing how children did with it. So she developed her whole system there. Um, she became really famous. The thing that she became kind of worldwide renowned for is she taught these poor slum children how to read and write when they were four, which is not, I mean, in the early 20th century, you didn't learn how to read it. Like you wouldn't have to read and write when you're in elementary school, when you're six, when you're seven. And even then it's hard. And the idea that these extremely underprivileged children not going to elite schools and not having tutors could, could be literate was shocking to people, completely shocking. And so she became, she wrote a book she did a lecture circuit, she went, she came to the US, she, she started spreading her ideas. That's how her, that was the kind of start for her life. Um, so that's the first, that's the kind of wow. initial- And when period. was this? Yeah. This was in 19, um, 1902 to 1907, the period that I'm talking okay. about now. Yeah, well. Um, shortly after, so she became famous, she did a lecture circuit for about 10 years, she participated in um, World's Fairs or the equivalent of World's Fairs. Um, she gained a huge following and, um, then political strife hit Europe. And, and she spent the next several decades, um, she tried to partner with Mussolini before he went full fascist and then saw her books burned and her schools closed. She went to Spain. She saw her schools closed in Spain and her, and her work banned in Spain. She, um, she went around in the 30s after the First World War, before the Second World War, trying to preach education as the solution to world peace. Um, obviously that didn't work out um, and she ended up fleeing to India for most of the rest of her life. So she spent a lot of her life in exile and struggling with issues of social discontent. And it became a major theme of her work is like, what's going on here? Like, what, you know, what, what are the solutions here? Why is the world going to hell um, given that mankind is in so many ways in like a very elevated state? Yeah. Wow. Why did she think that education was the solution to world peace? Um, for, you know, for similar reasons that a lot of people think of, about. So, I mean, e like everybody who gets involved in education is like, you get the child before they're corrupted, before, you know, kind of when they're in this pure state. And, th and there is a bit of that in Montessori. The idea is and it's this kind of, you know, this idea goes back to Rousseau, if not earlier, this idea that like, there's something, something happens to children to make them bad. And so um, if, if she, I mean, she's looking at like Nazis, like literally Hitler and the Axis powers and, and her, and her perspective is like, Hitler was a child. Like, where did Hitler come from? Like, how, how do Hitlers get formed? Like, it's not just like Hitlers are born. Um, Hitlers don't just emerge out of nowhere fully formed. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of people were taking this perspective at the time. So some of it is, is that it's like, what's going on here? Um, and some of it is, I, I think she was, She's, she was a devout Catholic, um, so um, this was very much part of her worldview. Um, but she was, part of her perspective on um, the horrors of the world is, we've been saying the same things for 2,000 years and saying them sincerely and teaching children to love one another and teaching children to love thy neighbor. And um, it's not working. Like, it's, it's, it's not like, well, we're not really doing it sincerely or we haven't done it enough or like something else is needed um, and so whatever educational approach we're trying with children, we're, tr we're trying with humanity, like it's innovation is needed there um, in order to kind of create children who are, who are better people. Um, I think that, that that's her most fundamental perspective on um, education and pieces. Like you're, you're shaping the soul of a child. That is, you don't do that by lecturing at them. Um, you don't do that by kind of like selecting a list of beliefs of good people and trying to kind of teach them to the child one by one. Um, you do that by shaping souls in a very subtle way by encouraging the child's independence and activity. And if you do that, if you really do that, then you're not going to have a society of, you know, millions of German sheep who like go along with a, um, an autocrat and, uh, um, you know, like you're going to have a society of independent people who reject that and are thinking and that, how do you create independent people is her question. Yeah. Wow. And what did she think about human progress? I know you have some comments on this. Yeah, um, she was, um, so as, as kind of awful as the things that she lived through were, um, her fundamental perspective on human beings was always a kind of awe 
at what the human species has accomplished. Um, she thought that, I mean, she, she uses different language. She thought that human beings didn't live in nature anymore. They lived in like a supra nature that they've constructed on top of nature. Um, like compare hunter gatherer societies to now, it's just the concerns are totally different. Um, the activities are very different, the kind of specialization and the knowledge base. We've, we've, we've erected this superstructure that is amazing and magnificent and it includes the arts and the sciences, but also things like trade. I mean, she, she was like, the fact that you could order meat in Italy from Greece is like, cr it's crazy. Like when, when did this happen? Like this is not a default feature of the human race. Um, and she saw, she saw this as an immensely good thing, um, as um, something that was not well understood, that was not well appreciated. She thought people kind of took everything for granted and then like things went bad and they were like, oh, how awful, human beings doing bad things. Um, she, she always had this kind of awe of like, look around at the world and, and what, like, what does it take for you to understand that we live in an amazing place? Yes, there are horrors, but there's also greatness. And, and what would it take for you to notice the greatness? Everybody notices the horrors, but what would it take for you to notice the greatness? And what role does education have to play in that? Um, I mean, I, I don't know fully where she got these ideas. Um, I, I think some of it is for Catholicism. She, I, she had some socialist ideas that were very important to her early in life. 20th century socialists are Marxists who are very concerned with global production and civilization. So um, there's, there's a complicated intellectual story that I don't fully understand. But what is very, very clear is she just loves human civilization. She loves technology. She loves society. She loves, the, she, I mean, she, what we would now call globalism. She didn't have a word for that. She loves globalism. She loves industry. She, whenever anything comes up in education, she's always like, who made that? Like, how do you teach the history of that? Where did that come from? That's her perspective. So very pro, very pro progress. Yeah. And she would have lived through. So if she, you know, you, you mentioned born in 1870s. So in her lifetime, she would have seen things like uh, the development of the electric industry, electric generators, yeah. lights, and motors, the invention of the automobile, the invention of the airplane, uh, the invention and of, uh, well, the telephone might, might've been right around when she was born. Uh, within a few years, but of course, the deployment of telephone networks throughout. Um, throughout she, she was she she knew Alexander Graham Bell. Um, and, wow! You know, so they they were she was he was a great advocate of the Montessori method. Yeah, uh, and then radio and television. You know, both again within her her later life. Um, and you know, and those are just those are just like a few a handful of things that occurred to me off the top of my head. But that that period in that late nineteenth century, late eighteen hundreds into early nineteen hundreds was an extraordinarily inventive uh period with a with and you know many entirely new industries being born so yeah yeah and she and she um she doesn't write about it a ton so so if you kind of read her works it's not like it, it's not going to jump out at you that like wow she was like a futurist technologist who loved all this stuff but she does yeah. say some, something about it so i even i have a couple of passages here so well the um, thing was at, at the time yeah. almost everybody was a futurist technologist yeah. in that in that a a general sort of optimism about progress and technology was kind of the zeitgeist of the age yeah um, so she would have been just a part of that but yeah if you have a quote love to but if you, i mean if you think about montessori like she she talks a lot about the souls of children and humanity and like all these spiritual things and then she and then she's like thinking when she's like human beings are great and she gives an example um, she, she has, we only have to look at civilization to realize the greatness of which man is capable, um, but we are focused on his errors and mistakes. Think how many things have been created. The wireless, to mention but one, the telegraph. Basically. Radio, yeah. Uh, radio, yeah, the telegraph. Um, look at, like, that's her example. Um, and then she says, look, we, we never think of the people who created that at all. Although we do everything we can to enhance our comfort, we do not think of the greatness of the creator. I mean, this is... Um, so she does have in mind these economic, industrial, technological innovations. There are other passages as well. This is not this is this is not a super common thing to say, but it's definitely not a one-off. And like that's that's her example of the greatness of the human spirit. And um, I don't think that that's well understood or appreciated now, even by really excellent Montessori educators. It's 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 kind of a subtle point in, in her writing. Yeah. yeah. And did she say anything about how that sort of appreciation or knowledge of, uh, of those great creations should be part of an education? Yeah, she did. Um, she made, she made some, she didn't ever worked it out into a system, but she said some very suggestive things. Um, so Montessori's view is that um, with everything, um, other human beings, yourself, the world around you, 
um, valuing it, loving it, appreciating it um, comes from understanding. Like you can't like make somebody love somebody else. You can't make somebody love something. You can't even make somebody respect themselves um, um, by telling them to. You have to make them under, what you can do is you can help them understand. You can help them understand and appreciate the people around them. You can help them understand and appreciate the world around them. And um, th this was, I mean, her, her approach here is, um, you know, do not preach brotherhood. Um, that's the thing that hasn't been working for centuries. You have to show, you have to show that human beings in fact have achieved a significant amount of brotherhood by teaching history, by, 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 by teaching essentially what, how did cooperation emerge? Um, how did, how did we get to this supernature point? Like what were the specific points? What, are, what is the history here? And once you understand that, like all the way from like, you know, it used to be that we had to push things. And then somebody was like, what if we put a wheel in water and the water turns the wheel and now we don't have to push that around. You know, like basic things all the way from there to like, um, I mean, in, in her time, I mean, and she writes a lot about this electricity, the invention of electricity was one of the most transformative things, or not the invention of electricity, the, the harnessing of electricity was one of the most transformative things. And um, the, how, like, she, she's like, you have to teach that history, teach Galvani and like teach, um, you know, the experiments with the frogs and, and ch children get into it and they get excited and they, they start to be like, wow, like nobody believed him and he had to really fight for this and his experiments were really radical and um, and then all of a sudden when they turn on a light, like they have a perspective um, that, that if you were just like, you know, lights are really important. They're not going to have that perspective. So she, she thought that you should teach history in a pretty factual way. Like she uses words like factual, precise, logical analysis, um, and that this would naturally result in appreciation and understanding in a way that um, preaching to people would never do. Um, so very non-didactic, very, very history heavy. Yeah. Uh, I just want to let everybody know we will be taking questions from the audience in um, uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, go ahead and just type questions into the chat and I will pick some questions out of the chat to, to read uh, for Matt. So, uh, so Matt, why did Higher Ground Education want to create this uh, a, a Progress Studies course? Um, for all the reasons I just said, I mean, it's, it's, um, I think it's a core part of Montessori, especially as students get older. Um, in the in the kind of standard Montessori curricular materials in elementary and the, the resource the resources that are recommended in adolescence, there's some of this. Like it's not like it's missing, but um, this view that a detailed understanding of specific even material things, not just like intellectual history or big ideas or scientific discoveries, but like I mean some of the stuff that you've written on, like where like where do soda cans come from? Like they don't just they don't grow on trees. They went through like dozens and dozens of iterations that all sucked until somebody had the thought of putting it together in a right, right way that made sense for both user consumption and packaging. And like that, like that perspective, I think um, is something that I've wanted to bring into our curriculum for a long time. I have been very excited to see that this progress movement um, um, pick up speed. It, it feels very Montessori to me. Um, and I'm really, really excited that you agreed to do it. <laughs> that, um, you know, some of this is about finding the experts, finding the people who study the history of economics and industry and figuring out how to translate their work into educational materials. It's not as simple as just like the work exists. There's a whole pedagogical process that has to be gone through and that, that's part of what we can help with. I think it's very core to what we do and I think it will become only more so over time. I think right now we're running this um, summer course with Jason, um, with you and um, I, you know, I'm excited about like, what does this look like five years from now? How does it inform our history and science and everything curriculum K-12? Um, I think it has a lot of, I think it has legs. Yeah. How do you think it, it fits in or should fit into sort of general history education or a, I don't know, a, a sort of a general education overall? Um, so the, the history of industry is, um, a, it's, not, it's not that commonly taught. Um, and it is very important, but it is not the only part of history. And, um, and th I mean, there are, uh, I mean, the, the history of civics, the history of ideas, even military history. Some of the things that are more standardly taught as part of history are very, very important. Um, I think that, um, I, I think that a lot of what you get in, in the kind of progress studies movement is, um, and the, the progress studies research and literature 
will illuminate that history. It kind of provides some missing links as to like, why are wars getting so much worse? And why is there, what, like, wh like, what is the relationship between technological advancements and these explosions of social unrest in the 18th century? Um, but the thing that's really cool about it um, that, and that I really like about it is that you can take it and apply it to any area of the curriculum. I mean, you could teach so everything that you learn in science, you can ask who discovered this and what challenges did they face? Um, every single thing that you learn in math, you can say, what problems was this person trying to solve? What came before, what came after? You can even take this approach to literature. Like what, in what context was this person writing? And this is, this is sometimes more commonly done to contextualize literature, but you could take it to the next level. Um, I, it's, I mean, Montessori did see history as the curricular integrator. And I think having a progress perspective on history really lets you understand that. It lets you understand everything that we're teaching is human progress. We're teaching students civilization in a kind of nutshell and, and hoping that they can take it away and use it as rocket fuel and understand the world. But it came from somewhere. You can have a historical perspective on that and you should have a historical perspective on that. Great, okay. Couple last questions, especially for the high schoolers um, in the audience and, and who will listen to this recording. Uh, what common wisdom uh, or, or advice that is commonly given to teenagers do you think is actually wrong? Oh man, um, a lot of it is wrong. Um, I think there's a lot of advice to teenagers that, amount, that, that amounts to, um, people don't put it like this, but it amounts to slow down and don't be so ambitious. Um, so um, don't be in a rush to grow up. Um, you know, take your, like, take your time, enjoy these years. Like you can, you can wait for that for later. I think all of that is wrong. Um, and, and if you look at history, you can see like, in, you know, in the night, even in the early 20th century, kind of what was expected of teenagers in terms of their performance and, and the things that they could do to innovate and work was massively different. I think you should have very high expectations for yourself, not, not to be hard on yourself, but to be like there should be no ceiling on what you're imagining that you can do in the near future. Um, so that's um, one thing. Um, another major thing is um, there's there's a family of slogans around kind of like find yourself, um, discover who you are, um, discover your values. And there's something to that. I think that this is a time for defining yourself and your worldview in a conscious way. Um, but um, part of what you need to be doing as an adolescent as a teen is um building yourself is like doing stuff like getting out like values aren't something that you find from within yourself values results in um the interaction of you and the world and challenges that you're facing and the effort that you that you put into producing them that that's part of what forges your character like life is not this inner process life is this interaction between the self and the world and I think part of what that means is, is embracing projects and work and letting yourself get excited about things and pursuing them and sticking with it a little bit longer than you might have otherwise, um, even when you lose interest in it. So, so to kind of build that persistence and like, have I really explored this? Like, I, I'm gonna push myself to explore it because who knows what's here. Like, that's the attitude you should, like Mike Montessori had this attitude. Mike Rowe, if you guys know him, he's, he's like dirty jobs, common, like go out and be a plumber. Like he has this attitude in his writings. I'm not saying you should literally be a plumber, but um, teenagers should be working and they should be working on jobs, interesting projects of their own, businesses that they're creating, pieces of art. You should be doing stuff as a teenager, not just um, reflecting and finding yourself. Great. Let's go to audience questions now. We've got a number of them accumulating in the chat. Uh, one of them got a, a plus one from someone else. So I'm going to start with that one. What has been learned about education uh, since Montessori that either validates or has augmented her approach? Yeah. Um, so she was, um, in addition to being a pedagogue and educator, she was a, um, she was a developmentalist. She was one of the first developmental psychologists who kind of really approached it oh. scientifically. And, um, and she, had, she had these specific um, beliefs about children. So here, here's one. Um, she thought that development unfolded in stages and that children under the age of six, their minds worked in a fundamentally different way, governed more by unconscious learning. And then once you turn six, it's governed more by conscious learning. And then when you turn 12, there's a whole kind of tumultuous phase again, where in some ways when you're an adolescent, you're like a toddler again. She, she had this whole account of this and, and she, she developed her learning theory to go along with this. Um, by and especially what she said about early childhood, which has now turned into a huge um, research area. Um, 
she, I mean, by and large, she was ahead of her time. I mean, she, it's, she made a big deal out of the fact that children learn language by absorbing it and not conscious instruction. This is a whole mm. psycho, early psycholinguistics, developmental psycholinguistics is a whole research area. Children, people use language like children are sensory motory bound and they have certain, um, not innate ideas, but um, concepts that are relatively developmentally canalized and that unfold in specific ways. Montessori wrote about these things. So I, I would say that psychology is the area where um, she's kind of been, like her, her ideas that underwrite her pedagogy have been most well validated in, in a lot of ways with neuroscience, with cognitive science, with developmental science. Um, in education, there's a lot that you could say, it's all kind of vague. So the first thing to say is um, the Montessori movement has grown massively. Um, there's now like, it's, it's shockingly high percent of students attend at least one year of Montessori school, like something like 5%, um, 6%. Um, a lot of them probably aren't that good, but it, it's, it's grown as its own thing. Another thing to say is, there's probably a lot of things that I said during this interview where you're like, don't all preschools do that? Like that's because she won that argument. So. Um, Montessori, you see Montessori materials and Montessori practices in all sorts of preschools. Um, I think that Montessori practice is still the best version of it, but she's been influential way beyond, um, way beyond her kind of initial impact. That's a kind of indirect answer to the question, but. Yeah, so to just riff on the question and, and maybe get yeah. a little more of what it's getting at, you know, have we learned anything since, since, since Montessori? Like, can we, do we know anything that she didn't know? Can we, can we do even better than her sort of original method? Um, I mean, the things that I think about in terms of learning theory, I do think that there's there's some things that we know, some specific things that we know that are a little bit um, um, specific. Like I would like if you wanted to get into the pedagogy of math, I could we could we could have a conversation about the way that children learn equations and fractions and how the Montessori material should be updated to do that. Um, more generally, how liter how or, or you could we could have the same conversation on literacy. Um, there's been a lot of great material that I think Montessori would have agreed with that like content knowledge is really important in literacy and then you have to kind of separate that from the skills the skill of literacy um, and there we've updated our we've updated our programming according to best practices on these on these scores um, I mean more general I mean generally I think the entire area of information technology has made I mean it's an untapped opportunity for, for like this isn't this isn't something that we know about education this is a fact about the world. The world is now, you know, software is eating the world. Like that is absolutely true. Um, how do you incorporate software into the prepared environment? Can you create a prepared abstract environment for children where they have autonomy and going through options, but there's still a lot of guided structure. Like it was hard to do that before software because like you could say go to the library, but, but it's not gonna kind of like help you go down a path. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities to expand Montessori. Still an indirect answer to the question. But that's the best I've got. Sorry. All right. Nope. Great. Cool. Okay. I am going to, um, we've got a bunch of questions now. I'm going to privilege some of the questions from the enrollees, uh, our, our yeah. high school enrollees in the class. Uh, so uh, Alex Kesson asks, what are the differences between Montessori and unschooling? Um, so unschooling is, is um, more of a progressive um, there's different versions of unschooling, so I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm just going to talk about the one that's kind of um, center mass, as kind of when I engage with the education community. Um, unschooling is a kind of um, progressive homeschooling approach that says um, um, there is something fundamentally wrong with the institution of school, um, and that the best, the best way to kind of think about it is to just get out of it altogether and to kind of go down a path with a combination of what you want to be doing on your own and your interests and homeschooling resources um, and to form social groups and kind of, um, you know, schooling cohorts on that basis. Um, Mon I mean, Montessori's view is that the school has a special place. Like, you don't, like, it's not like uniquely powerful in that if you can't go to school, you can't learn. That's not her view. But her view is um, there is a role for a, a kind of dedicated body of experts at an institution that is designed in a certain way for the student's needs. Um, and we should do it differently than traditional school, but it's not anti-school. It is a school. Like it is kind of fundamentally a school. Um, that's the short answer. Very, very short answer. Great. Julia Shore asks, how do you suggest that we integrate the Montessori technique into traditional schooling? So there's a couple of like things that I think are um, in certain ways low hanging fruit, but you know, if you, if you kind of, 
like any first step that you take towards implementing the Montessori method, you're going to feel pressure to change the whole system. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Mixed age classrooms are a big feature of Montessori. Um, so her view is that like having student, every single person in the class is like within one year, within a one year age band roughly of one another. And you've got like 30 students like that and they sit together and they learn together every day. Her view is that this is insanely artificial. Um, only in grade school does this happen in life. Nowhere else in life does this happen. Like even when you go to college, it's more mixed than that. Um, but in life, like I work with 60 year olds and 20 year olds and 30 year olds and like the, the people with more experience than me and less experience than me. Um, her view is that it's really important that schools be mixed age, partly so that students get a diversity of social experience. Students like come in, like looking up to the older students and they leave playing a leadership role. There's a social dynamic that evolves and you get to learn and participate in that. Um, partly because different people learn differently. Like not even plants grow at exactly the same rate when you, when you kind of grow them and line them up, much less something as complex as human beings. Like some human, like some students are gonna learn math more quickly and they can be kind of moved along more quickly, but learn literature more slowly and they need, so like, what do you do? Like, like you, you, don't, you don't want the way that you do instruction and deliver lessons and have, have groupings to be based on age. You want it to be based on the needs of the individual child. So that, that's a th I think that if you kind of pick one thing, like that's a major thing to do. School should be mixed age. But then once you do that, it's like, wait, how can schools be mixed age? Like then, then you can, like you, the teacher can't lecture to all the students at once if they're mixed age and they're all at different abilities. So now you have to be giving small group lessons. And to be giving small group lessons, the students have to be able to work independently when they're not getting lessons and pretty soon you have the Montessori method. <laughs> So it's it's hard to integrate Montessori into normal schools, um, but um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's a very different structure. Okay, question from Karnson about uh, measuring. Uh, his question is basically about measuring um, the impact of. I'll just read it out. How can we? Uh, how have we and could we measure the impact of different educational pedagogies on societal progress? Do you have any insight on where we're going with impact measurement research for education? I think it's a hugely, hugely important question and it's not solved. Um, so um, when people do education research, even longitudinal education research, like um, it, first of all, it's not at the level of society. It's at the level of like, how does, you know, a, how does your performance in a certain school environment affect your income over time or your happiness over time? Um, so it's still at the individual level. Um, second of all, people, when they do education research and assessment research, they're not typically assessing pedagogies. Um, that, so Montessori is this like radically different approach to education. If you go into a Montessori classroom, it doesn't look anything like a traditional classroom. It doesn't run anything like a traditional classroom. Um, it's not that easy to set up like an experiment where you're kind of like, you've got like a control group who's going to Montessori and, a, and a, um, an ex sorry, a control group is going to traditional school and an experimental group that's going to Montessori and you measure them over time. People are starting to do that research, but it, it's fraught with kind of empirical difficulties. Um, but, the, but the bigger answer is, I just, I don't think that we're that good at assessment and education in general. Like, I don't even think that we're that good at assessing students like math and reading ability. Um, much less their like independence and, and, and creativity and innovativeness. I think we need, I don't think it's impossible to measure those things. I think we need to get better at it, but it's a whole, this is a life's work kind of figuring out how to assess what we really care about in education and then how to measure that at the scales that matter for like really um, figuring out what we want to change in education over time quickly, um, which I think another challenge with education is your like your um, feedback loop cycle is about 18 years, right? So um, try an educational approach, see what happens in 18 years, right? Um, and like that's a very slow feedback cycle. And so you need other, you need kind of other intermediate mechanisms to kind of be able to tell what's going well and what's going poorly. I can give you anecdotes. Like I could, I could be like the following awesome people went to Montessori school and, um, and but that's, you know, that's the level at which it's at. Um, yeah. Okay, question from uh, Juan David Campolargo. Mm -hmm. Why do you think independence and working on your own projects are so important? Uh, he mentions he's very independent and works on many projects and he likes it, but why is it important in general? Um, so I think if, if you kind of, there's this great essay by um, Martha Graham. Um, um, the dan she's a famous dancer um, who um, she was asked um, what's a hard-earned belief of yours? Um, what's, what's like something that you believe that's like 
really contentious and controversial and you came to it really reluctantly. And her answer was, I believe that for every single thing, you learn it by practice. And if you, so the idea, and it sounds simple, um, this idea, you learn everything by practice. But if you take it to like making friends, you learn by practice. Crap, that means you have to like screw up and struggle and like, then eventually you like learn how to make friends and be a good friend. But it's like, there's nothing that anybody can tell you to accelerate that. Um, I think that, that like that, that's also true for values for having for, for kind of your career for the things that you want to work on there's no way to figure out what you want to do I mean kind of what will make your life meaningful other than doing it and to do it is to do it yourself like there, there is no distinction between I think working on a project and working on a project independently you can collaborate with others on a project too but but there's like in, in a sense it's independent work it's you choosing this thing and you you engaging not just like selecting a or B or C, though you are doing that, you're choosing which thing to work on, but you're also choosing to continuously engage and put in the effort and see what you get out of it. Is it worth it? What happens when I kind of push on this? Um, you have to practice that. Um, and, and, and you have to practice that because working on stuff is important in life. Like you're, I mean, my belief in Montessori, definitely Montessori's belief is work is central to your life. Um, like, to, like all work, her quote is all work has dignity. The only thing that doesn't have dignity is not working. Um, is to not work. She thought that work was really critical to developing other virtues and other character traits. Um, how do you get that if you don't work on independent projects independently? Like there is no other way, I think. That, that's, the, that's the argument. Yeah. Nick Whitaker asks, uh, how does Montessori respond to Kaplan style critiques of education? So Nick, I assume you're uh, referring to Brian Kaplan who wrote a book, The Case Against Education. Um, what is the what argument? Yeah, so what I remember, I, I've only read the introduction to that book, but it was mostly about higher education and sort of how it's kind of overpriced and mostly about signaling status. Actually, I'll just unmute you, Nick. Do you want to give a very brief, because we're, we're low on time, but give a very brief kind of what are some of the top couple of things that Kaplan said about education? Yeah, I mean, one of the things he really emphasizes is that so many of the kind of um, the skills you learn aren't going to be used in your career. And to the extent you kind of think that we're like teaching how to learn, a lot of times we're not nearly as good as transferring skills that we learn to other things in the ways that that sort of um, yeah. paradigm would expect. So I'm just kind of, I'm starting to see how Montessori might have an answer to those, but just if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so her, her I mean, there is no bypassing the issue that education needs to be future-proof. Like the world is changing. Um, like even like the things that people think are hot now, like software development, like I think that they'll probably be hot in 18 years, but they might not be like the world is changing really rapidly. Like we have to equip children in a way that whatever happens, wherever they end up, whenever they end up you know, kind of needing to think and act and work, um, they have that capacity. They're adaptable. Um, they have skills that transfer to use, to use the standard terminology. Um, and her approach is heavily focused on fundamentals, but teaching them in a way that the, that the student can adapt them. I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic with all of those critiques. Like, I think, in fact, um, a lot of schools are about credentialing and that a lot of the skills that you learn don't transfer that well. Um, I, I mean, my advice to students is learn skills that transfer well. Like, but like, you, like, if you go to college and you don't seriously think about how to become a better writer while you're at college, you're, you're kind of wasting an opportunity. Writing is a very transferable skill. But there are other things, too. Like, what is your knowledge of the humanities? What, it, Like, how well do you um, how well do you have like a basic framework knowledge of science such that you can ask questions about it? The major forces in the world like um, software engineering, do you even understand what they are? Like I'm not saying you have to be a computer programmer, but if like you don't know what a function is and it's just a total, it's magic to you. Um, there's a way that you're not gonna be able to get along in the world. There's fundamentals that you need to learn that will unlock other things. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is that um, I think I have a very negative view of most US high schools. Um, I think um, there are high schools that are good where you can learn a lot. So this is not a universal thing. There's a lot of variants, but there are a lot of high schools that I essentially teach you nothing, or you might be better off just not going at all. Um, and the function that the university has come to fill is I think being a proper high school. So more and more, um, like the university is where you go to learn the basics of the humanities and history. The university is where you learn how to write. The university is where you get kind of proper networking and mentoring. And um, as, as it overpriced as it is, and as burdened with a kind of administrative bureaucracy as it is, and as many problems as it has, there's still a, 
um, it's still better equipped to do those things in my view um, than a lot of other institutions. So, um, Great. That's my so we have, personal view. Yeah. Sorry. We have, uh, we got five minutes left. Let's see if maybe give some brief answers to a few last questions. Sure. Um, Paul Tierney asks, how are induction and hierarchy handled by the Montessori method? Uh, so the child's going to go follow their interests, but also there's, you know, subjects have prereqs. He gives an example of the child's interested in rockets. Do they have to learn all of physics and chemistry before they can, you know, go, go study rockets? I mean, the Montessori method has a, has a standard scope and sequence. Like there, there is a curriculum of, that's a mixture of hands-on learning materials and other things um, that, you know, once you master one, you naturally become interested in the other and that's, that's the hook for the next. Um, so that's the kind of default um, scope and sequence from early childhood through, through at least elementary. Um, if a child is interested in rockets, do they need to learn chemistry and physics, physics to do rockets? Well, do they? I mean, the, like there's a, there's a reality oriented perspective on that in Montessori, I think. Like it's like, well, what can you do? Without, without learning this stuff. And, um, and if you can't do it, how do you connect the child's interests up to the kind of prerequisite in such a way that they see it as motivated and connected? Um, hierarchy is, it's, it's complicated, especially, and prerequisites are complicated, especially when you get to kind of practical things and practical interests. I think you can do a lot with a little, especially in today's modern world where there are um, products that help you do that. Um, and the educator's job is to make nuanced judgments about how to take the child's interest in rockets or whatever and milk that, kind of make sure that, that the child's interest is manifest, manifesting in maximum long-term value. There, it's not just like rockets are fun, so we're gonna let the child do rockets. It's rockets are fun, like how can we, how can we imbue this interest with kind of foundational learning that is future-proof even if the child loses interest in rockets later? That's the perspective. Yeah, great. Michael Riedler asks, what is the best funding mechanism you've seen working uh, to make this method of schooling more accessible to a broader set of students, including ones who can't afford fees? Um, I think, I mean, in principle, I think Montessori can be made extremely cheap. Um, it's not cheap, partly because, I mean, we're going to get into my own views on this, not necessarily higher grounds views or Maria Montessori's views, but um, um, their, their, their education is a, is a kind of, it's a, it's a nationalized industry in the U S that's also true in a lot of countries. Um, the kind of default structures and inefficiencies and financial, the way that financial incentives work, um, there was very, very, very little pressure, um, kind of in the system to make education cheaper. Um, there is pressure. People want education to be cheaper, but most people don't pay for education. Um, and most education is free. And, um, and, and most people who kind of seek out something different are doing something extraordinary and outside of the default systems of society. So I think that like part, part, that's part of the problem. Um, in terms of specific funding mechanisms, we've done things with, um, we've done things to explore scholarships and financial aid. Um, the fees are really expensive. Um, I think that they should be driven cheaper. We've done things within our model to try to figure out like, okay, like how can we get it down from, like if you can get it down from, you know, $1,500 a month to $800 a month, all of a sudden you're like about the same price as Head Start programs and you can start to integrate with philanthropic organizations. There's different things that we've tried, but ultimately I think, um, I think a lot of innovation is needed on the funding side of not just Montessori, but just education more generally. I, I think it's a broken system in the same way that the healthcare yeah. funding system is broken. So, Yeah, and I will just note that for the Progress Studies for Young Scholars program, we do have scholarships available. And yeah. if you're interested, please mention that when you apply and we'll send you some information. All right, we're unfortunately about out of time. There's a bunch more questions. People, uh, uh, Matt, if, uh, if people wanna follow you or, uh, or ping you online with questions, do you wanna give your, your Twitter handle or something else yeah. where they can? Twitter's the easiest way. I'm at M-B-A-T-E-M-A-N M -B -A -T -E -M -A -N on Twitter. Um, and um, you can DM me. We can exchange emails. Um, that, but that's probably the easiest thing to do. Great. In my opinion, Matt does not have enough Twitter followers. So I encourage everyone to go follow him <laughs> at M Bateman uh, on Twitter. And all right, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, I just want to say again, we have some great upcoming events next week. Tyler Cowan uh, on Tuesday, June 9th. Uh, after the week after that, Patrick Collison on Wednesday, June 17th, and the week after that, Max Roser of Our World and Data at Oxford uh, on Wednesday, June 24th. Please follow Progress Studies for Young Scholars on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our mailing list to uh, hear about all those events. Thank you all for attending. This was a great kickoff and hope to see you next week.
Thanks for attending everyone. And I'm really looking forward to those other talks. They sound very exciting. Bye. So long.